Aloha and welcome to Connection to the Cosmos with your host, me, Dr. Lisa Thompson, where I have out of this world conversations with extraordinary people. Today, I'm really excited to have on Bruce Smith, and we're going to bring him on in just a moment, but first a few announcements. If you haven't had the opportunity to grab my free 20-minute meditative journey um, to meet your galactic family and guides, then make sure you grab that on my website, mysticmanta.com or drlisajthompson.com. In February, February 22nd and 23rd, I'm going to be teaching my Galactic Ascension Channel Certification Program. So if you are in the healing field, that is something for you to look at. And um, April 30th to May 4th, I'll be leading my Galactic Retreat here on the Big Island of Hawaii. Deep dive connection to really connect with your Galactics. And finally, if you're coming to Hawaii, specifically to the Big Island, Kona side, then come on one of my big island UFO tours where you will see the night sky in a whole new way using my Generation 3 military night vision goggles. Okay, so without further ado, hi, Bruce. Hi, Lisa. I'm so excited to have you here because we're going to, I'm going to share your bio and my audience, my regulars will understand right away why this is going to be a fun conversation. I, 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 I only see part of the screen. Um, everything's reduced i hit yep. the button this is how we are okay all right so everything's copacetic we are good okay. <laughs> yep. okay so ruth smith is the author of becoming god realized stories from my journey it is his collection of 50 true stories that trace his development as a spiritual being, starting with being a kid growing up in an upper middle class family on Long Island and eventually migrating to Yelm, Washington to study full time with Ramtha, the enlightened woman. So Bruce and I, we were fellow Ramtha students together and Bruce knew my mother. <laughs> so. yes. your, your mom was one of my first friends. I, and you, we went to school at the same time, but I don't remember you at all. I'm trying to, you know, like, well, she 20 years younger. Yeah. Well, you know, I was a teenager when yeah. I was. Yeah. So, yeah. So we moved in 1986 and I was 13. So that's probably why. Yeah. Well, that I, I missed you then because I didn't get there until 90. Okay. But when you came back as an adult, you were like 2000, 2003. So I came back. Um, I got reintroduced in 2000 and in 2000, December of 2000 and was then a participating student until 2006. Yeah, that, that, that's, those are my glory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we know a lot of the same people, I'm sure. Um, yeah. But I, I would love for you to share with the audience kind of just a little bit of how you grew up, because I've read your book, so mm -hmm. I, I know the, the journey, but um, you have a very interesting kind of twisty road that you've taken to get to where you are. So how'd you grow up? Spiritual, religious, something else? A, a little a little of everything, a little of all of the above. Um, I uh, grew up in an upper middle class neighborhood that was totally Catholic. I went to Catholic schools. I didn't go, I, I even graduated, I graduated uh, high school with Bill O'Reilly. Um, uh, we, uh, we graduated from Chaminade High School in Mineola, New York, uh, 1967. Uh, I didn't, we weren't friends then, but I knew who he was, and uh, I knew he was pretty strange back in those days. Um, and I would talk about him at dinner to my family, and my mother said, to this day, I remember what my mother said, said that boy can't see the forest for the trees. Mm. No. Um, but I was, not only was I an altar boy, I was one of the first uh, members of, St. Anne's congregation that was a lector. So when they started bringing the congregants up to read stuff and participate in the mass, I was one of those first ones. And I was a teenager myself, you know, I'm, this is back in the sixties. Um, and there was only a couple of the guys that did it. My Boy Scout troop was Catholic. We went to mass every day at, at Boy Scout camp, summer camp. Um, and then, um, then I changed. Yeah. So what prompted the change? Yeah, um, the, uh, the inspiration. I, I went. I went when I went to college. It was like I was shot out of a cannon, and uh, away from constraints. It was. A, I grew up in a very uptight, strict, Catholic, 
upper up, upwardly mobile, professionally focused environment, my family, the neighborhood, the whole nine yards. And when I went to college, it was like, screw it all, you know? Um, and uh, it was the sixties, hippies, you know, growing the hair along, uh, started uh, hitchhiking around and seeing things. And I was always a new agey kind of guy, but I was never a follower or, or anybody. Oh. <laughs> what can I tell you? Life's interruptions. Like, okay. <laughs> Maybe you'll edit it out. Maybe not. You know. I don't it's all, edit. No. It's, yeah, it's all organic. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'll call her back later. You know. Anyway, so um, reading Edgar Casey, uh, interesting experience. I was just telling a friend of mine this. Uh, we were talking about Seth. Uh, in the '80s, I was I had a commercial beach cleaning business. I had machines. Um, I had two machines that were modified potato pickers, and they would dig in the ground and, and remove things. And I used them primarily to clean beaches because the machine didn't know the difference between a potato or a hamburger bun. And I f found out that I could use them <clears throat> to pick rocks in equestrian areas. And this one equestrian arena up in Oswego, New York, called me and said, we got a mess up here. Can you help us out? I went up there with my crew and my machines. And they're working in a lot of rocks. And uh, I, I'm going out to the deli to get lunch for everybody. And I'm just driving into the town of Oswego. And I just feel a pull to pull over in this one particular block. I pull over. And it's like, where's the deli? I don't see one. And I said, oh, I, see, I see a bookstore. I walk into the bookstore. And as I come up to the counter, there are two piles of books on either side, five feet high, Seth Speaks. Hmm. I go, ooh. I, I go to the gal behind the counter. I says, you know, sounds interesting. I guess I'll buy it. She says, yeah, well, Jane Roberts used to live in Oswego. She died a year or two ago. I says, wow, okay, you know. So uh, I read it, and it was cool. I loved it. And I'm eating at, I'm reading Edgar Cayce. Um, uh, whenever I would get sick, um, my, uh, the partner I was living with uh, that I write about extensively, BJ, she'd buy me like cool books like uh, the Eric uh, Donakin stuff and the Nazca lines. She didn't believe it at all, but she knew I really loved it. So she, she, that was the kind of relationship she had. She didn't share my passions, but she supported my passions. Okay. And, uh, yeah, you know. That's good important. A good gal to help to help up with, you know. All right, and um, so I'm just reading stuff and cruising along, and um, then one day, uh, this tabloid newspaper showed up in my mailbox, and being a beach cleaner and a sometime rock picker, I had the winners were kind of loosey goosey. So I'm reading the the tabloid, and it's from the Ramtha people. It wasn't produced by Ramtha or Jay-Z Knight, who channels Ramtha. It was produced by some of the students, and it was called Windwards. And when I first started reading, I go, oh, my God, this is a cult, and I threw it away. And then I just, like in a trance, got up from my desk and walked out to the garbage can and pulled it out of the garbage and started reading it again. I go, wow, this is cool. you know. And I loved reading about what Ramtha was saying on the nature of reality. And what really struck home for me was his predictions of the earth changes. Mm -hmm. Now, working in the environment, now we're talking 1988, 1987, something along those lines, um, I was already becoming aware professionally of global climate change and sea level rise. And I flew down to a conference. I was invited to a conference to talk about um, maritime pollution what what was i picking up on the beaches as a beach cleaner and so i was going to a conference in charleston south carolina and i sat next to a guy who was an engineer for the port authority of new york and we're talking about things that are changing that i could see and he could see and he predicted uh he predicted the hurricane sandy of the destruction what would happen if new york city and the harbor got hit on the nose with a big time hurricane and everything he had predicted in the 80s came true in 2012, 30 years later, whatever like that, smack a rumor. And he told me that in the 80s, 
he had measured sea level rise in New York Harbor that was already a foot higher than it was during the Civil War when mm. the Union Navy started measuring uh, the water because they were going to start building forts in case the Confederates invaded New York Harbor. And so in the 80s, it's already up a foot. And it's like, yeah, you know, and we're talking about things, uh, the wave action in the, in the North Atlantic had already increased 20%. The rate of rogue wave action, what what he, locally, like a kid growing up on Long Island, what we called the surfer wave. When I was a kid surfing, it was the seventh wave. The seventh wave was going to be the good one. That's the one you want to catch. Well, by the late 1980s, the surfer wave was the sixth wave. Mm -hmm. So energy was already in the water. And nowadays, when I go back to New York, I can't swim where I where I used to swim. It, it, the the water is too rough, and the currents, the rip currents. Oh my God, they go, they're going to rip you right out. So I, I have to go back to the baby beaches where the waters are very little and gentle and I'm just bobbing up and down with the seagulls and that's the best that I can do. They, I can't handle the big stuff. And uh, so that kind of, I had that background knowledge. And when Ramtha was talking about what's coming down the road, you know, the days to come. That's yeah, my mom, know. my mom and I, or yeah. my, sorry, my mom and Anne. We were right there, baby, <laughs> days to they, come. Yeah. Well, that's why we moved from Oklahoma to Yelm. Yeah. Because uh, they went to that specific one in 1985 in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, stockpiling food and water, two years worth of food and water. Yeah. Um, and so I was, I was all on board with that. And uh, my lady, BJ, <laughs> nope. <laughs> We had, we had our first argument. I had 500 pounds of rice and beans stockpiled on the front porch. And she came home from work one day after I just brought it in. And she says, what the hell is that? And I said, that's my rice and beans for two years. That's our rice and beans for two years. And she, did, she was so angry, she couldn't even talk. She just turned right around and slammed that door. I thought the wall was going to come down. <laughs> that was, it's like, oh, and because of my training with Ramtha, I just focused on me and it's like, okay, I didn't get emotional. It's like, that's, that's her, that's her emotion. Mm -hmm. And she went off driving for an hour somewhere, came back. Yeah, we need to talk. And it's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, that was, those were the early days of my transformation of, of how it all came about. Um, the, the, the Winwards tabloid, was the the thing I, I never heard of Ramtha. Nobody I knew had yeah. ever talked about Ramtha. So this was my first introduction. And um, I, I think Ramtha had a hand in it. I, I, I don't think this was random. I said, hey, yeah, hey, yeah we want that guy over there. <laughs> bring bring well, him in. <laughs> well, and the thing, though, is that didn't it keep showing up? Yeah, the, the mag, the tabloid kept coming, and I kept yeah. enjoying it more, and I would look forward to it. And I realized, hey, hey wait a second, I, I, you know, I can't wait for um, the the universe to bring, deliver this to me. I need, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be sovereign. I'm going to take responsibility for my life. I'm going to call them up and, and get a subscription. So I called them up, and uh, I said, you know, uh, I, I want to buy a subscription. They said, no, you already have one. I said, no, 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 no it must be a trial subscription, you know, like a new agey thing. And <laughs> I said, no. Uh, they got angry at me. They said, uh, you have a subscription, Mr. Smith. Uh, we suggest you enjoy it. You have nine more months left. Uh, I said, but I hadn't paid for anything. She said, well, you're all paid up. And I said, okay. I, I don't know who paid, but it wasn't me. You know, so I think we have to put some energy into that electronic, electromagnetic computer strippy thing and got me into the address file. And here I am. Okay. Five years later. Yeah. <laughs> you end up moving to Yelm then. Yeah. Right? yeah. I commuted for a year or two, going to some events like a retreat, something like that, I'd go back to New York. And the tension just built. Everybody thought I was crazy. Um, then the aliens started coming. You want to talk about aliens? Let's, <laughs> let's yes. Perfect segue. Okay, right. Because <laughs> it, it all goes hand in hand. I mean, it's the one thing just in what you know, it's like, no, we got things, everything's dancing together. Um, so when I started commuting out to the ramp of the school, 
uh, I made a friend, a guy's name is Jeff London, uh, people who in the ramp the school, uh, he ran uh, another tabloid newspaper. Uh, I forget what it was called, um, The Sovereign Scribe. Mm-hmm. And that was, the, that was my first writing gig. Jeff, my friend Jeff hired me to interview some people back in New York. And uh, one of my first interviews was with Zechariah Sitchin, um, who had written a very popular book uh, called The Twelfth Planet, I believe, that has yeah. to deal with the Nephilim and the Anunnaki and all the, what happened in the good old days, you know, back back when. Um, at any rate, um, so I'm, I'm going out to a retreat and I'm staying with Jeff. And so I was already relatively aware of UFOs. I, I, you know, when I'm, I'm reading Eric Danikin and Edgar Casey and UFO books and uh, Bud Hopkins, I'd read all the Bud Hopkins books uh, in the 80s. And so I was aware of the hybridization program and that the Greys mm-hmm. uh, needed uh, human genetic material. And one night I woke up in a cold sweat, totally lucid, totally awake. And I hear this telepathic voice in my head. um, Hi, we'd like to have sex with you. And it's like, you know, we need we need your genetic material. Can can we get some? And I said, you're the greys, right? Yeah, I I heard about you. And I I know about this hybrid program, but there's a lot on my plate right now. I'm living in New York. My wife's going crazy. You know, I got the 500 pounds of rice and beans. You know, it, 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 it. how about six months? You know, give me six months and get the, I'll get back to me. You know? <laughs> so, and then they went away. It's like, okay. Next day I wake up, I go, Jeff, did I have a dream last night? Oh, what a doozy. And he goes, hey, you know, maybe it's real. I said, oh, come on. This happens to other people. It doesn't happen to me. He goes, well, maybe it did. Well, the next night it happened again. I go, oh, shit, you know, here we go again. <laughs> this time I'm paralyzed. And that pissed me off. Mm. And I'm lying on my side and I couldn't move and they want to have sex, but I'm going, no, you know, and I invoked my teachings from Ramtha. And I said, from the Lord God of my being, I raised my arm. And as I did raise my arm and draped it over my head, behind me, I had a vision. I could see their spaceship, huge, um, tall, unlike anything I've ever seen anywhere else in any magazines or pictures or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it was, imagine an ice cream cone. So it was tapered, the bottom two thirds were tapered like an ice cream cone. And on top, instead of a dollop of ice cream, would be like a saucer. And then the ice cream would be on top of a saucer plate. And where the ice cream dollops were, were windows. And I could see beans looking at me. And it's all lit up and there's lights everywhere, red and white and green and blue. Oh, it's just, it's beautiful. I go, wow, so beautiful. And then the voice came. Will you have sex with us? I said, no, I don't like being paralyzed. I don't like how this is going. This is not my, this is not my, my way of doing business, you know? And, and everything snapped out, it's gone. And then it came right back, all in gray. Mm. And it was like, oh, you want the good stuff? You're going to have to be part of the team. <laughs> you know? You know, you, 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 know, you, you don't pay, mm-hmm. you, you don't play. Well, one thing that I just want to bring up real quick before you yeah. continue on is that, you know, what I understand and is that, you know, they they can't go against our free will. So if we are very actively saying no, I mean, however, I, everything I have strong contact. I have strong mixed feelings about that perspective. Okay, and yeah. well, and and this could be some of the conversation because we also, you know, as I understand, uh, we we do have soul contract agreements for all of this to happen. Because I'm part of the hybrid program too, but yeah, I, know. I, I would have been like, "Yes, sign me up." <laughs> I ended up just quickly after 
these two experiences and seeing the spaceship. I go back to New York. I'm with BJ. They come into the bedroom. I'm in New York, in bed with BJ. They come in and they have sex with me. They just get on top of me. It's like, we're not asking. We're just here. Let's do it. And I enjoyed it. I thought it was great. All right. I feel terrible afterwards. Oh my God, I've just cheated on my wife. She's sitting next, she's lying next to me. And, um, and I was in therapy and I go, I have a therapy. I was in a lot of therapy. Um, leaving, leaving New York and going to the Ramsa school. My last week in New York, I was in therapy five out of six days. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and that, that's what got me through it. Um, a lot of tension, a lot of confusion, a lot of, oh my God's, um, torn in different directions, a lot of guilt, uh, but uh, doing the disciplines and focusing and meditating, and uh, it, it got me through. <clears throat> and my therapist said, um, she was nonplussed. She says, oh, you know, the Freudian interpretation is that, Bruce, you, uh, you're so dissatisfied with your romantic relationships in your life right now that you think, uh, you know, it's so unattainable. You're going to have to go to outer space to go find a girlfriend. And when she said it, it was like, well, I guess so. <laughs> it makes sense to me how far how far out do I have to go <laughs> you know so um um that that led up to interviewing Zechariah Sitchin at a conference for my friend Jeff and Bud Hopkins was there and he talked about the, the guys having sex with aliens and the hybrid program I go ballistic I go nuts I'm like a puddle on the floor when he's talking I have a strong emotional reaction to it. it's like oh, this is legit this is real stuff holy shamoly and um it it knocked me on my heels but by then i was already packed up and heading to yelm and i i i, I came out to yelm and i was kind of like in a fog half the time I'm like whoo oh whoa whoa whoa, whoa. <laughs> here we go <laughs> I'm on my way. Don't know where I'm going, but I'm on my way. <laughs> Making good time, too. <laughs> so, yeah, that's me and the aliens. Um, and when I got out to Jeff and uh, came to Yelm and was living here, then I I really dug down. I went looking for the kids. I would focus on them, go into meditations. And, where are my kids? And I would call out to the aliens. It's like, I want to participate. You, you know, you got me. So now I want to be you know, act, I want to, I want to, you know, mm -hmm. let's do it. And they, nothing, nothing but crickets, total silence. Um, and then I'd be really focused. It's like, man, you know, if I did to somebody else, what the aliens were doing to me and like stealing fetuses out of the women, by then I'm already in some support groups and zooming and it's like, oh my God, you know, women are pregnant and they're not. It's like, oh, and they're in trauma and they're yelling and screaming and crying. It's like, this is a mess. It's like, no one seems to be in charge. And it's like, don't they have social workers in outer space? Like the Galactic Federation, come on, someone's got to step up and do something here. These guys are out of control. You got, you got some you got some crazy people doing crazy shit out here. You know, come on, let's get it together. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So I saw it from a very psychodynamic. Uh, you know, working fourteen years in psychiatry, it's like, hey, we need we need a program here. You know, and uh, um, then I said, no more. I'm done. Forget about it. And I didn't hear from them for the next thirty years. Hmm. They didn't bother me. I didn't go looking for them. They didn't come looking for me. Thirty years, almost. 28 and I got back into it and it brings me to where I am today with you and talking to you because a direct line um I got a uh, by then I'm already a professional storyteller I'm you know moved to Nashville working on my voice singing guitar you know uh entering competitions I'm the 1998 national storytelling champion of the year second runner-up or something like that <clears throat> and um um I got a, there was a call from an organization called Risk. They wanted stories about unusual sexual experiences. I said, oh, I've got a story for you. <laughs> you know, how about sex with aliens? You know, and they said, sounds good to us. <laughs> <laughs> we got you booked. I said, great. We only pay 40 bucks. I said, I'll take it. And um, so that got me into it. And to get back up to speed, I started looking at all the videos and catching up. Who's doing what? I, I 
Bud Hopkins had already passed away. Uh, John Mack da- had died. It's like, oh, my God, even John's gone too? Oh, man, we, we're in rough shape, you know? Um, and uh, I never met John Mack, but I was part of his research program, um, and I learned a lot from him, and I read his books, and they're fascinating and fantastic. Um, and that slowly led me to channels and uh, Alex Ferrari, Next Level Soul, um, George Nuri's Beyond Belief, uh, and Ruben Langdon, who just opened up <laughs> the world to me. Uh, he, he has hundreds, seemingly hundreds, of interviews with folks like you, and that's how I heard about you. I, you know, go, right. And when I and I so I'm zooming in, and you, you're talking about Rantha. It's like, wow, you were there too. Oh yeah, wow. you know. <laughs> and, and for those who are interested in Rantha, you got to see Lisa's podcast from a few weeks ago with, with Alan Steinfeld. Fantastic, fantastic interview. Alan's a genius, and he gives the most articulate, comprehensive, and balanced and nuanced understanding of what Grantus has taught and the importance and how it's impacted his life. It's a fantastic presentation and analysis. Love that guy. Um, yeah, fun. Yeah. Oh. Oh. And I mean, speaking of Ruben, like the whole thing of me getting, like actually being willing to channel, because my ETs are like, we want you to channel and I'm like oh because there was so much stigma of being a Ramtha student in Yelm being a teenager because mm-hmm. I mean a highly religious town lots of churches in Yelm for how small it was back then and very judgy people <laughs> I that, that was my experience as a teen and um so I never thought that I would do anything like that I, I'm astonished that you came back you kids the, the Ramtha kids who's parents dragged them to the ramp the school um you guys had a rough go yeah it was was tough interesting times i empathize i want to hear more we we need to get you guys together and put you in a circle and uh get some red wine going and let's let's hear your stories because you got a lot to say yeah well and you know in my later teen years i did I chose to stop going to the events, yeah. but then when I was 28, I got reintroduced by my my mother's chiropractor, not Joe, not Doctor Joe, but Gordy. Oh, okay, <laughs> and Gordy, no, you know him too, sure. Right. Well, no, we dated for 10 months. Oh wow! Yep. Yeah. Um, That's one, one of his many L's. <laughs> <laughs> the Lores he's, and the Leases. Oh, he's. <laughs> and, I think Taylor Swift has a song about about a relationship i know it's going to end badly but will you please remember me (laughs) so gordy when i met him he at that point i had my phd and he was like you would love it now you know there's all this science all the Mm -hmm. science underlying the spiritual stuff and um so that's what got me back in actually Mm -hmm. was because they were having people like bruce lipton come in and yeah yeah and all the quantum mechanics and so Oh, yeah. I loved it. And in, um, before I became a beach cleaner um, and became a working in psychiatry as an activity therapist, when I was going to school, I ended up uh, trying, I was ended up being pre-med, doing a lot of different kinds of things. I ended up in pre-med and really struggled with the science, the biology and the, the physics, in particular, the chemistry. I worked really, really hard and couldn't get anything better than a B. And fortunately, fortunately, Best thing that never happened to me. I didn't get into medical school. But I learned the science. So when Ramster started talking about quantum physics and bosons and fermions and electrons and protons, okay. And I could see that everyone else in the arena, they're going like, what? 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 Uh, uh, I know what an electron is, but what's a fermion? <laughs> you know? But I, I, had, I had a working familiarity and really blessed my journey, even though it was hard as hell going through school. And re- I really debated with myself on a daily basis, what the hell am I doing? But mm-hmm. it seemed purposeful, so I kept at it. You know? So, um, and, and in fact, so we're here to talk about 
my book, Becoming God Real Life, Stories from My Journey, which you got half of it already. <laughs> <laughs> but there's another book that I've, I've been writing in parallel, and it's, um, um, and it's the science of consciousness. And I, I've titled it to uh, the new physics and to the science of consciousness. And, um, and when in our glory years, 2003, four, five, and six, somewhere around there, that's when I started writing it. And that's when What the Bleep came out. Yep. And I, I, I've seen that movie eight times in the movie theaters. Um, that's, and I was, every time I go, I bring somebody else. I said, you got to see this movie. And then afterwards I go, wow, I, you know, one person fell asleep, fell asleep on me, you know? So I wrote, I wrote, I started writing my book to explain the, somebody else's movie to my friends who were falling asleep on me, you know, and family. BJ was, BJ had an intellectual and, you know, well, okay, mind over matter. I'm open. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I lost her within two minutes. <laughs> well, then, um, actually, so when I had my first official date with Skip, you know, my my husband that passed away, um, it, it was like a 12-hour date. But that, that night, we went back to my house, and I made him watch What the Bleep ah! um, as a test <laughs> to make sure that he could hang in in my realm or you know understand my perspective of things did he embrace it or he just tolerated what he do he he was always um kind of on the fence he was always mm -hmm. extremely supportive of everything mm -hmm. that i did even if he didn't understand it mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. he um where my previous husband before him complete opposite like total skeptic and even though we met right after I had left the school and I told him, you know, I'm still, it's not that I'm anti school, mm -hmm. um, but this is who I am. I am this spiritual being and he, he's a chameleon. And so he pretended like he was fine with it. And then after I got pregnant and had my son with him, um, then he switched and then it wasn't okay. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Yeah. yeah. So, but my first husband, because um, I've been married three times, my first husband, we actually met um, at the Ramtha school. And my yeah. daughter was named by Ramtha when I was there, yeah. five months pregnant with her. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I, I've been, um, I've had four significant relationships uh, in my life with women. Uh, two were marriages and both were, both were students in the Ramtha school that I met in, you know, through school. Um, and both ended very shortly very abruptly. Um, the, my longer term relationships, BJ in New York, and then there was another student uh, that I lived with for a number of years in the Yelm area. Um, interesting enough, I always felt married to them. And I always, when I look back on them, and I'm still friends with them, I always think of myself as, you know, I'm their ex, you know, that it's my ex-wife. And I said, you know, did you ever feel married? And they go, hell no. <laughs> Whoa, that's a, that's a little harsh. Don't you think? Hell no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's my life. That's my love life. <laughs> well, so after all of these years, um, okay, so you've written this book, Becoming yeah. God Realized. So to explain in whatever words you want to to the audience what that actually means to you. What okay. is what is being God realized? Yeah, two things. At its most fundamental level, being God realized to me means I'm more than just my body. I'm more than just a human being. All right. After that, after that realization, it gets a little tricky. It's like, well, what is God? You're God realized? Well, who's God? Like the God or the, you know, you know, it, 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 mm -hmm. it, it gets to be a struggle. Um, but I'll say this, I, I, in general, I like how some of the Eastern religions talk about the God force as the all in all, um, or the isness. I, I feel, I've always felt comfortable whenever I would hear that. I go, yeah, I like that. God is so, it, it, this, you know, the Judeo-Christian image, 
uh, Islamic image of God is just a singular figure, a being, usually a guy, big beard. Oh, no, no, no. That's so limiting. Um, now, um, I, I kind of embrace kind of what, what Ramthas has talked about and what I hear from a lot of channels is that the source. So I'm, I'm, I'm more, so I could say source realized. Um, got, uh, Ramtha talks about primary consciousness and that we're secondary consciousness, the primary consciousness form secondary consciousness to, to embark on experiences, to reflect back to primary consciousness life. And that as a general outline is kind of how I see things and that I'm comfortable with. Um, and I think that's echoed back from most of what I'm hearing in the philosophical presentations from the folks that you channel and other people are channeling. And I'm, I, I love that. I love that. And, and, and that's what we're moving towards is a more, a, a greater realization of that. Yeah. Now, in, term, in, terms, in terms of me and my experience, I realized I was God realized walking down my driveway about one o'clock in the morning, which I did with some frequency. I called it a walking meditation, but those of us who are in the school, we know this is the neighborhood walk. That's the term we use. All right. Yeah. But I have been advised multiple times by administrators at Brampton School of Enlightenment, which we would call RSE. Don't, can't use that. Not in public. It's like, yeah, really? But anyway, uh, so I just call it a walking meditation where I'm going up and down my driveway, which is about 100 feet, 150 feet. And I would focus on a tree or a telephone pole or something or a branch, you know, and that's, and I'm focusing on something, something I want to create, something I want to get rid of, better health, um, you know, uh, more money, paying the bills. I want my car to run right. Uh, that was a big thing, right and tight. My car runs right and tight. Um, and it just hit me. I'm God. I'm a human. I'm both. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Holy shamoli. Yeah. I'm divine and screwed up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm unlimited and broke. I'm all of it. <laughs> I'm lonely and I'm one with everyone. <laughs> I'm horny and enlightened. <laughs> oh, you know, that was quite a night. That was quite a walk up and down the driveway. And it was just, it was just one connection after the other. And I had a, an, a number of stories in the book take place in my driveway. Mm -hmm. um, many of my paranormal and interdimensional experiences, my visions took place in the driveway, walking up and down. You know, the glitter, the glows, the, uh, I saw um, what I call miniature northern lights, uh, a shimmering curtain of plasma fields and colors, yellows and greens and golds and reds. And, you know, I was like, wow, that looks nice. Um, and then always, always at the same time, the flying Vs. Hmm. I thought they were bats or birds, and it's like, no, they're moving too slow. Um, well, and being yeah. in that kind of alpha state during the kind of walking meditation like that, you know, and being probably soft focused, that's when mm -hmm. we can see things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was able to maintain that nightly for a few years. Um, I call it the glory years through 03, 04, 05, 06. Um, and then I got tired. I got exhausted. Um, and I left school somewhere around 08, 09, 010, I think somewhere in there. I, I just got coming up with the money to go to events. And try, you know, just I was exhausted trying to be remarkable. You know, Ramtha was, be a remarkable, be remarkable, remarkable mind. I was like, I, I was, I was spent and I, I just stopped. Mm -hmm. And six months later, I realized, you know, I was, had been living in a bubble. And um, by then things had opened up for me in the world. And 
writing and getting a job as a newspaper reporter. And, and that led to becoming in doing investigations and then writing a book on D.B. Cooper. And I've been in a, a number of uh, documentaries. In fact, two weeks ago, I came back from Burbank on another shoot, on another TV show about D.B. Cooper. Well, yeah, so you, have an, you were going to share um, remote viewing stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So um, I've, I've written three books on D.B. Cooper, um, basically edition one, edition two, edition three. Um, and and the, for, the, there may be audience members who don't know who D.B. Cooper is. DB, the the D.B. Cooper case is the only unsolved skyjacking in the history of the world. Um, D.B. Cooper stole an airplane in 1971 in Portland, Oregon, and they were on in route to Seattle. And he said, when we get to Seattle, um, give me $200,000 in cash and four parachutes, and I'll give you your passengers back. And Northwest Orient Airlines says, you got a deal. FBI, eh, they wanted a shootout. Northwest told them, calm down, guys. We want our plane back with no holes in it. And uh, so the deal went down, and D.B. Cooper got his money, got his parachutes, and the plane happened to be a 727. For those of us who are of an older age, we know the 727 had an internal staircase system. Um, nowadays, no, because every, every, every airport has a jetway. You just walk down the ramp, and you're on the plane. Back in the day, though, uh, you had to walk down to the runway and climb up some stairs, and yeah, that was a pain in the ass. And so they built planes with staircases in them, and this 727 happened to be the, one of these that had the stairs, and DB, that's the one D.B. Cooper stole. And he lowered the stairs in flight and jumped out, and it's never been seen since, and no one knows anything. And they never found anything. Never found him, the body, the money, nothing, except uh, a small portion of the money was found 10 years later, there about eight years, eight, nine years later, uh, buried on a beach on the Columbia River uh, in Vancouver, Washington. And nobody knows how the money got there or when. So there's two mysteries. Who's D.B. Cooper? And how'd the money get here? And where's the rest of it? So that's, that's the history channel is, you know, <laughs> wants to keep talking to me. So that's, so that's what I did when I left the school. Uh, that was my journey. And, um, and I've been writing a lot since. And, uh, and I had always, uh, and had been a storyteller, had been a performer, uh, like I said, Nashville. Mm -hmm. And, uh, tell, and um, so I started putting all the, some, half, most of the stories that are in the book are performance pieces. I've told them many times from the stage the different audiences. And I put them all together in a certain kind of order and, and edited some of them um, so that they show the arc of how I have grown, not only as a man, but as a spiritual being. So it's a, it really is a showcase of my spiritual journey uh, for whatever it has been. And uh, hence the title, Becoming God Realized Stories from my journey. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I it's not out yet officially. No, no, it's in the process of being formatted. And yeah. and the question is, are we going to take it to Amazon or is it going to go to Balboa Press and Hay House? And, it, you know, they want money. And so, okay. So we'll we can see. talk about that when we get off the recording. Okay. <laughs> Look, I'm open. I, in fact, I brought it up in the channeling session um, with Ruben uh, recently. Uh, he was channeling a woman by the name of Gail Thomas, who you would love and would fit right in on, on this format. And she channels uh, a collect, another collective. Uh, and these ones are Andromedans, I believe. And they call themselves TARP. And I'd never heard of them before. But they were fascinating and very articulate and informative. And Gail Thomas is an excellent channel. And she was working overtime because they put out a lot of information. And what I heard primarily was that their primary focus is to assist and protect the creative energies and the creative people in the human realm here on earth at this time. I go, I'm one of them, guys. Come on, let's talk. And they said, Yeah, we're aware of you and your book. And, you know, we're, and they started clapping. And I said, yeah. <laughs> so I've been in meditation trying to hook up with them and, you know, connect. And um, interestingly enough, the first 
message I got from them was confirmation. One of my DB Cooper buddies I'd sent the book to, and he wrote, and I asked for a blurb, and he wrote he wrote me a, a blurb back that was exquisitely elegant, and I go, did Nikki really write this or did he plagiarize it? And he's trying to butter me up, and I asked the tarp, and I said, no, it's legit, because we gave him the words, we channeled it to him, <laughs> and he picked it up. And yeah. I asked, I told him, he says, yeah, the words just kind of came to me. And that, that, that happens sometimes. I go, Nikki, <laughs> join the club. <laughs> well, and that's the that's another thing about channeling is that we are, all of us channel. Yeah. Anytime yeah. we're creative. We yeah. Channel, yeah. That's not coming from our brain, right? Yeah. And so there are many ways that it can come through. So, yeah. That's, that's a big question that I have, and I'm bringing, I'm thinking about it a lot and focusing on it and bringing it up to these, in, the, in these channeling sessions on the Zoom calls, is who am I really? You know, uh, and who is this higher self? And who is, what's imagination and, and original thoughts? And where do songs come from? Where does poetry come from? Is that, come, is that me? I thought it was me, but you know, now I'm not so sure. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Maybe that's why they call it the higher self, uh, you know. But I know I'm in charge down here because I'm the one paying the bills. I'm writing the checks. Yeah. So, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, I have a book coming out in the next two or maybe two, three months um, Awakening to Your Multi Dimensional Self. So, uh, well, hey, so I'll read it, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a copy. Yeah. Tell me how much to send me. We're all multi dimensional beings. And yeah. so, when yeah. we really understand that, um, mm -hmm. it allows us to not necessarily take this earth life so seriously. <laughs> I mean, there's there's an extent, yes, we're here to be human and yeah. go through all these experiences, but then we also are here to explore. And as mm -hmm. Alan reminded me on that show, make known the unknown, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, I, I've had some big awakenings on that to really be in my body, to um, have a lot more confidence mm -hmm. and, uh, sexually, um, having sex with a man for the first time in my life. That was a big thing. Um, that's the first time I've ever said that publicly. Um, but that kind of transformation, it's like, um, um, it's, it's, you know, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. It's it, it's 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 mm -hmm. physical. It's humanness. Yeah. You know? and, and and I'm getting I'm getting this real sense. It's like do it all. You know, be it all, and and embrace it and love it. Mm -hmm. I had one channel get angry at me because I wasn't loving my anger, <laughs> and she's yelling at me. And she was yelling at Ruben too because he's a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was a, you know, it's like you know, you're you're angry and you're annoyed and you're pissed off and you love it. That's that's you, you know. And your attitude of what you think a, an an enlightened being is is bullshit. <laughs> it's limiting. Stop limiting yourself. And I go, okay, yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. Well, in our last just couple minutes here, is there anything else that you would love to share? Any words of wisdom or anything else that you would love to share with the audience? Words of wisdom. Wisdom. Um, life is good. Love. Go for the love. Go for joy. I mean, that's that's what we're hearing from people, and um, and it's it, it's for our time. You know. Um, we're coming up on the election. Uh, we're recording this a couple okay. of days before the election, right? Uh, and just before we and just before we started recording, I got a phone call from my brother-in-law. He's going crazy in New York about the elections, you know, because he, he was just down the street from Madison Square Garden where Trump had the rally, and you know, okay. and uh, he is he's in it. He's in that emotional turmoil and angst and. Well, and this is going to be um, in a November when when this will go live. So whatever happened with the election. Right. And, <laughs> and, and we'll talk about it then because there'll be plenty. 
it, the focus that I have now will be the focus then, regardless of what happens. And I, and I hear this over and over from other channels, and it's something that I've organically have evolved in my own head, is I, I want to focus on my life. Yes. My joy. Where do I want to live? Yes. Living, living closer to nature. Who do I want to live with? What kinds of conversations do I want to have? And pulling and and pulling away from the chaos and the yeah. drama and all of the angry people and the violent people. I, as a as a good ramster, I was I was armed. I was armed. I was weaponized. I've given all my guns and ammunition away. I said I I ain't fighting. I, I'm not, I don't want a war. I'm not in it. I'm doing something else. That's where I am too. Yeah. So you're yeah. in good company. Thank you. I am. It's so <laughs> Yes. Well, Bruce, it has been such a pleasure to have you on. And, uh, my delight, my, and my I, true delight, Lisa. And your book truly, like when it does come out, um, yeah. everyone needs to get a copy of it because your stories are fantastic. and. And then when your new book comes out, the one that you're working on. The Science of Consciousness. I got to, you know, yeah. Well, we can have you back on. That's right. That's right. Okay. And so appreciate you being here. And for those of you um, watching or listening, as always, thank you for being here on Connection to the Cosmos. And I'll see you next time. Aloha. Indeed. Aloha.